Welcome to the textbook. Today we will read William Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey. The full title of this poem is Lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour, July 1798. Often the poem is simply called Tintern Abbey. The poem is in five sections. This poem was written in July 1798. It was one of the 19th poems that Wordsworth contributed to lyrical ballads. The poem Tintern Abbey is a statement of Wordsworth's complete philosophy of nature. The memory of the beautiful scene of nature round Tintern Abbey has been affording relief to the poet in moments of trouble and distress. 5 years have passed, 5 summers with the length of 5 long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky the first section describes the setting for the meditation the poem begins with wordsworth's declaration of the fact that after a gap of 5 years he has been able to visit the banks of the wye and the adjoining landscape once again he is overjoyed to hear the murmuring flow of water in the river wye as he discreetly beholds the serene landscape consisting of sharp and towering wooded hills uniting with the clear sky the scene encourages a deep feeling of solitude seclusion and introspection The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground these orchard tufts which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses Once again I see these hedgerows hardly hedgerows little lines of sportive wood run wild these pastoral farms green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees with some uncertain notice as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone here the poet says that the green cottage garden orchard tufts loaded with unripe fruits clad in one green hue the pastoral farms the smoke which might be coming from the dwelling of some vagabond or the cave of a hermit only enhance his happiness and deep seclusion The unbroken green of the countryside denotes a happy coexistence of man and nature, cultivation and wilderness. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but often lonely ruins and mid the din of towns and cities. I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart. and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love in this second section the poet asserts that in the period that has elapsed between his first visit and the present one the serene landscape and its natural beauty the physically absent during these 5 years have never been absent to him he gained enormous amount of pleasure and happiness out of the recollection of the landscape the natural beauty has seeped into his soul so powerfully that it has restored him to tranquility amid the squalor and weariness of urban life and has prompted him to be kind and generous no less i trust to them i may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime that blessed mood in which the burthen of the mystery in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things Here the poet says that seeing the landscape with the mind's eye has uplifted him to the height of spiritual ecstasy producing a blessed mood of calmness which dissolved the negativities of life Wordsworth says that the confluence of nature's sublime face 
and its soothing features banish the cares and anxieties from the mind of the person who feasts his eyes in the beauty of the landscape around him. Slowly, he calms his frayed nerves till he reaches a state of absolute rest. This is the state of tranquility and peace that a person engrossed in worldly affairs cannot attain. The inner self experiences real harmony and joy. If this be but a vain belief, yet oh! How often darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how often spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan why, thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee. And now with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity the picture of the mind revives again. This section is in one way a reiteration of the experiences involving the effect of why and the adjoining landscape during their physical absence. On the other hand, the poet refuses to view his belief as a mere figment of imagination. It inspired in him an exalted state of higher spiritual consciousness which enabled him to understand the harmony in greater nature and cosmos and in all inanimate things which are touched by the same power. He ascertains that in the midst of joyless and tiring urban existence, his spirit has regularly turned to why and has received the bountiful calmness that he so desperately needed. Why here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a row I bounded over the mountains, by the sides of the deep rivers, and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads, than one who sought the thing he loved. In this fourth section, the speaker says, that standing before the majestic yet serenely simple beauty of the landscape, he feels the revival of the mental picture of the landscape that he consciously and unconsciously carried within him. He anticipates that the present experience of the landscape is going to gift him more sustenance for future years. He is assured of the presence of deeper and graver powers of nature. Not only shall this nature present him with abundant resources of happiness for the present occasion, but also food, metaphysically thoughtful and spiritually purgative, for the future. He presents a comparison between his present self and his previous self in the context of the two visits paid to the banks of Y. His psyche and spirit has altered a great deal. He is no longer the youth who in the pursuit of beauty and freedom could only satisfy the sensuous needs of his body and mind by drinking to the ease the beauteous aspects of nature. During his earlier visit, Nature seemed to him a magician casting a spell intoxicating his mind with sights and sounds, which would present before him a diversion from the mundane din and bustle of urban existence. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion, the tall rock, the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm, by thought supplied nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint eye, no mourn nor murmur, other gifts have followed for such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. Here the poet says that, earlier he was intoxicated by the sounding cataract which would haunt him, he was awed by the deep, gloomy woods and was charmed by the liberation he could enjoy in the local filled with rocks and mountains. At that point in time, nature appeared to him as a mere means for the coarser delights of the senses. Wordsworth, returning to his present sensibility and understanding of what nature has done in promoting his growth, declares the stage of ecstasy and insane sensuous agitation to be over. However, he is in no mood to mourn the loss. He is rather overjoyed to notice that such loss is compensated by a sense of the sublime, 
which has been gifted to him by the effective power of nature. He now looks at nature with the eye of the adult, not fueled by boyish agitations of sensuous delight, but conditioned by a deeper insightful consideration of the sorrows and hardships of fellow human beings. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, no harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit, that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rules through all things. Here the poet says that, now nature appears to him as no diversion but the source of thought in man. Nature now is a mysterious system, the greater cosmos which holds together the living and the non-living objects and aspects and all the binaries of the world. Nature is the source of pleasure still, but it is now the chief supplier of spiritual wisdom and thought which permeates every aspect of creation. He is still the drinker of the intoxication that nature's beauteous sights and sounds offer, but in addition to that he is now made wiser. Contemplating such sights and sounds now lead him towards the purest thoughts involving humanity and morality. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they have create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. The stanza ends with an eloquent tribute to the outward forms of nature which act as a gateway to the world of mystical vision, which unites human consciousness with the elements and the cosmos. No perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay, for thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river, thou my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. In the fifth and last section, the speaker states that nature remains the friend, philosopher and guide of his life on earth. Nature provides the inspiration and sustenance for his existence. The speaker states that his life would have decayed and wasted away if he had not come under and benefited from the invigorating influence of nature. All the lasting lofty pleasures of his life came by gazing at the nature around him. Oh! Yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister, and this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. It is her privilege, through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy, for she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall ever prevail against us, or disturb our cheerful faith, that all which we behold is full of blessings. Here the author brings in his sister, Dorothy. He should have done it at the beginning of the poem, but waited till now to mention her. It becomes clear that he has been wandering around with his dear sister Dorothy as his companion. He addresses her as his dearest friend. He speaks about Dorothy's voice and expressive eyes that exude the same charm as they did five years ago. The speaker reminisces about the way he looked at nature then. He says that he can see his former self in her sister. Here Wordsworth reiterates his love for his sister quite eloquently. He learns to see his own self in his sister and prays nature to let him have this joy. He says that the benign nature does not betray its lovers. He feels his sister mirrors all that is good in nature. He feels that Dorothy has changed little in the last five years and retains her old charm. He implores nature to save him from the myriad pernicious experiences in life, such as sarcasms of selfish people, wild men, 
unsavory words, bad judgments. Therefore let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain vines be free, to blow against thee, and, in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies, O oh then, if solitude or fear, or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me, and these my exhortations. Here Wordsworth affirms his faith in nature's capacity to shield us against the corrosive influences of life. This is a benefit which accrues to those who seek refuge in it. The speaker knows how corrosive and dull life's day-to-day -day existence might be. To save Dorothy from such humdrum existence, he beseeches nature to shower its bounty on his sister. He wants the moon to light her solitary path, the misty winds from the mountains to blow against her face, etc. He knows these ecstatic experiences will bring bliss and joy to her. Here Wordsworth says that his mind overflows with love for his sister Dorothy. He wants nature to bequeath all its beauty and bounty to Dorothy, so that her mind becomes a repository of all its sublime sights and sounds. She could then, Use these memories to tide over all the difficulties of life, like solitude, fear, pain and suffering. When death takes him away from her, he wants her to remember him with the help of all the reminiscences about their joyful quest of nature. No perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes, these gleams of past existence wilt thou. Then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream, we stood together, and that I so long a worshipper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, O oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. Nor wilt thou then forget, that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs, and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. Here Wordsworth says that he becomes emotional about the possibility of his separation from her due to his death. He wants her to remember their common love for nature. With a sense of deep appreciation of his love for nature and his sister, he wants to dedicate his memories of the woods, stream, grazing fields, rocks etc. to Dorothy, so that she could remember him when she gazed at nature.